Hi, I'm Mike Lappel for biznews.com. The recent Dischem gate, if we can call it that, that had predominantly white customers cutting up their Dischem loyalty cards after an internal memo was leaked, basically saying, look, whites are not going to be hired due to employment equity targets. Uh, it caused quite a stir and has focused the spotlight on the issue of employment equity amendment bill currently before the president. Many believe that legislation that particular legislation is ripe for a constitutional challenge. Deskem's internal memo was seemingly in anticipation of the punitive measures that await companies once that legislation comes into effect. Joining me to unpack this whole saga is Pete LaRue, CEO of Sarkelicha. Pete, thanks for your time. You've written a letter recently titled, We Do Not Have to Accept the State's Harmful Ideology. Is what went down at Discam a symptom of what you're calling a harmful ideology? Yes, one could even say that it is an economy captured by the state. Uh, we have an economic environment in which companies like Discam, ostensibly uh, independent companies listed on the JSE with huge brand value and sizable legal departments, not able to say no to government. And in fact, um, trying to explain themselves and justify them within the dominant ideology, uh, which is race-based employment. And that is a very harmful uh, ideology. And our letter to Sarkilikha's members last week was to say that we do not have to accept that. There are other ways to add value. And in fact, there's actually only a way, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a road that leads to ruin. If everybody actually does what government ostensibly requires of them and what in Diskim's letters, at least Diskim says it wants to achieve. Is the anger towards Diskim misplaced in a sense? Because surely this isn't the only company thinking along these lines. To a greater extent, it's, it's happening in most boardrooms right now. People are talking about this. But it was just the fact that the memo got leaked. You know, business in this country must surely be nervous. Yeah, look, um, Ivan Zaltzman of Diskim wrote down what he was intending to do. And uh, in fact, I think, in, you know, we, we can, of course, lament what he said, but it was also revealing. It was revealing because the memo, while official in this case, is unofficial in many other companies' case. And it's been that way for at least a decade or two in South Africa. And uh, as the state's ideology uh, got stronger and stronger, and as regulations and codes permeated and created this toxic environment uh, in which businesses are being robbed of their independence, um, in, in, this, uh, in this environment, it, it has happened before and it is happening. And that is why I think we should not focus too much on this game, uh, even though what, what this game did is rejectable on many levels. And um, you can replace the words uh, who they prohibit for employment with any other group or any other ethnicity, and it would be obviously unacceptable. Why is it acceptable in the case of prohibiting white people for employment, putting a moratorium on that? And now, so Diskim's letter was revealing, but um, it is a moment for business in South Africa to also reflect um, and think about the road ahead. Isn't this a fork where we can either go down the road Diskim's letter takes us, and that is the road to ruin, or we can regain our independence, uh, coordinate and stand up and create an alternative environment in which we are not so toxically incentivized as to succumb to such a harmful policy. Because this is harmful, not to the companies only, and, but in the end to the customers and to the public. The state's racial ideology is a harmful ideology. It's our constitutional duty to oppose it. You make the point in your letter to your members that in the aftermath of that leaked memo, the Deskim board released their own statement lamenting, quote, the wording and tone of Ivan Saltzman's message, but they didn't dispute the actual essence of it. Um, and they said very delicately, we apologize for the erroneous communication which caused offense to any South African community. 
Now that's a <laughs> a politically correct minefield the board stepped into there, refusing to say, look, white South Africans, yammer, sorry. You're upset about this uh, equity targets that are set by the government, and there's this law coming into effect potentially, and we're going to be t- fined 10% you know, of turnover. That's going to be financially ruinous for us. What did you make of the, the board's response? I think it's not um, it's not uh, it's not reflective enough. It reveals a board that is um, at least from the letter that the reflection which only of which only went so far as to say how can we do what government requires of us, but just not in such an affronting manner. And that is not a responsible or sufficient uh, approach by business in South Africa when we know a policy such as this is harmful. And it's harmful not only, of course, and affronting not only to the white possible employees that can now not be appointed or the existing employees who cannot be promoted. It is an affront to the essence of doing business, which is adding value based on considerations of maximizing the good for the public. Of course, earning a return on that, which is how you are measured. But as soon as you introduce other considerations in this case, In this case, government's very direct, very onerous, uh, morally uh, affronting requirements. Then you are introducing a secondary objective. You are um, introducing a political priority into and substituting uh, what should be the priority, namely uh, serving the public with your goods and services at the best possible cost. That is our social role as business, and we are doing that an injustice if we accept uh, even whether we pay lip service or actually apply, um, as in this Kim's case, the requirements of government, we are not uh, doing our duty. If or when this employment equity amendment bill, this legislation, which is currently sitting on the president's desk, is passed, if it is passed in its current form, it gives the Labour Minister Tula Singlesi the right to set racial quotas for different industries. Explain to me why this is a bad thing. It's a bad thing because it substitutes um, entrepreneurial-led capital allocation in the country, business decision-making, based on what business has always done, which is to provide goods and services. And it uh, introduces a political decision-making. Um, it robs businesses of their independence, and in so doing, uh, they will be less successful. They will not be less successful because they are appointing uh, black people. They will be less successful because they are not making good business decisions. It's quite foreseeable that there will be some companies in South Africa uh, that even have 100% uh, black uh, uh, staff component. Uh, that does not say anything about the success of the business. But what we do know is that we will detract from the success of uh, businesses if we have them follow government's prescriptions or what their employees or their shareholders or their customers or their mergers and acquisitions should look like based on race. It is, of course, advisable for companies to have a good relationship with the communities in which they operate. And um, that uh, is a that is an art, not a policy from government. And that art will be a, and has to be applied differently by different business owners, depending on their circumstances, depending on their resources, depending on the kinds of business they do. And uh, over time, we will that art will reveal who was successful and who wasn't, and who has the support of the public and who does not, whose client base is expanding and who does not. And uh, But it cannot be uh, from national government prescribed who should uh, do watch. So when Minister Tulas Ngezi comes uh, and in this new employment equity amendment bill, which is yet to be signed by the president, and uh, uses the national racial demographics, the national break, r- racial breakdown of the country as a yardstick for, uh, for business in South Africa, that is sure to be disastrous. It is unthinkable um, that business can perform um, by having at every level, at every office, at every um, workplace, the national racial demographics uh, applied from the lowest paid to the highest paid uh, workers. It'll be ruinous not only to family businesses, but also to big, large corporates. 
Um, uh, so mm. it's uh, so. Let me stress that, uh, of course, Sarklicha will oppose, as many others will oppose, um, what, such uh, a law if it is indeed signed and when it is signed. Uh, but it will also it is also a, 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 an opportunity to realise that as state failure accelerates, the government has less and less ability to enforce its harmful policies, and we should not um, seek to apply these harmful policies beyond what uh, the government's ability at least is to enforce them. And even there we should resist, but we should not seek to be as compliant as possible in the hope that we will escape the wrath of a government that is obsessed by something else than serving the public, uh, which is its race-based ideology. So, Pitt, you're speaking a lot about what the government shouldn't do. And that is, as as you say, go along with race-based policies. But how do we then, what should the government do? How does it transform the economy without setting these targets, without drafting legislation? Would you argue for more organic growth? The economy grows, therefore more people of all races are employed. Is Is that your line of thinking? Well, it would have been a sure, a sure improvement on whatever government has done so far. We're sitting in a lackluster economy. We've even had through lockdown um, uh, declines in economic growth that, have, that has not been recovered. Uh, not only the Zuma years, but even before, was definitely under potential. Um, Mr. Ramaphosa has, um, you know, he's come in as supposedly a reformer, but during his tenure, many of these race-based laws, including someone like Minister Abraham Patel's, uh, transformation of the competition regulation into uh, race transformation uh, regulations have, have gone from strength to strength. So, um, yes, my and I think the, the alternative is what it has always been. If we want a successful economy that flourishes and where people are served, then we must remember that the end of business is not to reflect the national political priorities. The end of business is to produce goods and services for public enjoyment. And um, that is the object. And if we introduce racial, uh, uh, racial transformation and racial quotas and racial targets, we are going to detract from that. So you can, you can, you can choose that, but the, the consequence will be a poorer South Africa uh, and a uh, harmed public. And that is the consequence if you go for racial quotas. Hmm. I'm going to pivot slightly. E-tolls. It was widely rejected by motorists in Gauteng, and it was law to pay your e-tolls, right? If you drove on the highways, you had to pay. It was, this, it was the biggest single civil disobedience campaign in democratic South Africa because all motorists were against it, including an alliance partner of the ANC, Kasatu, was against it. What, what you're calling for, in a sense, yes, there's the legal avenue, and you said you're going to challenge this, but you also want companies, as you say, to stand up and say to government, we're not going to follow through on this. You are, in a sense, asking for civil disobedience at, at a much higher level from business. Is, is that something you're asking for? And you're going to run into a problem here. I know it's not a, an, an exactly apples with apples comparison here, but one civil disobedience campaign worked because everybody was united against it. I suppose you have a, you're up against it here because race transformation in South Africa, that's a, that's a hell of a hot topic. Michael, when something doesn't make sense and when it is harmful, when it is fundamentally unconstitutional, and I mean unconstitutional in a deep sense, in the sense of that the purpose of a constitutional order is to arrange for the distribution and allocation and exercise of powers such that um, the social order is a flourishing one. That, uh, in, in that order, our deepest responsibility uh, or our deepest responsibility is to serve that order as citizens. Now, when something doesn't make sense, when it contradicts that order, it will eventually fall apart and it may take some time. And that is why it's important not to, um, uh, to take into consideration the prevailing sentiments in the country, why it's important to take into consideration the prevailing sentiments among your staff, among your uh, clientele, uh, among everybody else in the country in the business environment which you operate. But it is still uh, important to go in the right direction. This game takes us in the wrong one. And the right direction is um, not complying, just as is the case with ETO. 
uh, when you are faced with a political uh, instruction uh, that, uh, that harms your ability to do business, to serve your goal of serving the public, then the direction to move in is away from that. doesn't mean you're going to have to do that in all senses. That's why we must have some appreciation for the difficulties of DISCAM, because DISCAM is operating in this toxic environment just like all other companies in South Africa. But I certainly foresee in an environment of state failure the, that the ability of government to enforce its most harmful and most uh, illogical policies uh, will decline. And in that vacuum of power, um, you will be able to do your business uh, based on a different ethos, on the ethos, ethos of adding value uh, instead of on the one prescribed by government. Um, it's also important to note that in this South Africa of the next 10 years, we're going to see more state failure rather than less. And in that environment, we're also going to see uh, some other people stepping in to fill those vacuums. And what we're suggesting at Sarkalicha is that we're either going to see gangsters or mafias uh, whether it's the construction mafia in a, in a most patent sense, but also in other spheres, going to step up and say that they are in charge. The alternative is that different sections of society, including business, organize based on an ethos of adding value and um, oppose these uh, threats of disorder. And so, Michael, there's no, there no clear recipe for when you should obey or, or disobey um, and a harmful policy because there are always consequences. Um, and sometimes those consequences could mean that your business shuts down. But what we have seen in the DISCAM case and what we do when we reflect, see sometimes among other companies, amongst ourselves as well, is that we are too eager to comply when we should still be pushing back much harder. And uh, there's the state of disarray at national government level is certainly such that this is an opportune moment to push back. We have seen what's come out of the Zondo Commission, uh, and it's clear that government's ideology um, is harmful. It's a time to push back. Uh, it's very a very opportune time.